our final speaker of the evening. Come on down, Kip, you can take the stage. Uh, Kip, Kip is our dear Nerd Knight friend and supporter. He is a returning Nerd Knight speaker, having already done this before. He talked about gravitational waves because his day job is professor of physics at the University of Tokyo. Um, but in his spare time, he rummages through secondhand stores and online auctions. He buys and fixes electronic equipment that will let him fix other electronic equipment. And we have some of his stuff uh, down here in the front. So when, when this is over, you can come and take a look and he'll demonstrate what's going on. So Kip is going to tell us about his experience keeping the landfills of Japan free of e-waste and why you should support the right to repair movement. Kip. Hello? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Kip Cannon. I have, I'm Canadian. Um, uh, the name comes from Ireland, and that's a, a rare example of a Western name that is also exactly a Japanese name. And if you, uh, if you can't read this, uh, find a Japanese person next to you that's and ask right. them. <laughs> yeah. Ask them what it says and make a friend. Okay. Uh, so... <clears throat> That's basically it. Uh, yeah, I'm a, as, as Amanda said, I uh, work at the University of Tokyo. I head the Research Center for the Early Universe's uh, Observational Gravitational Wave Research Laboratory. I use gravitational wave detectors like LIGO, Virgo, and Kagura to look for space-time disturbances created by black hole collisions. And when I was typing this, I thought, wow, this sounds really exciting. <laughs> but um, I just sit at a computer and enter Python code all day, basically. Um, <laughs> But today we had a detection. This is S190412M. Uh, this is probably the brightest time frequency track we've seen. So this is a public alert. Uh, anyone who's got the app got the announcement. Um, so this is why my slides were, were late to Amanda. I missed the 4 p.m. deadline today. Uh, okay. So my pastime is fixing electronics. And when um, I started thinking about what to talk about, I realized I didn't really know, you know how to put a circle around fixing electronics. And I thought, well, is is changing a light bulb, is that fixing electronics? I thought, oh my god, everybody fixes electronics. My hobby's stupid and boring. Um, <laughs> so I thought, well, what is it? Like, what do I really mean? And I thought, well, I think the key ingredient is, is the need to solve a problem, right? So the thing about fixing a light bulbs is that's part of the normal life cycle of that product. You, there's no mystery to solve. You don't have to do any diagnosis. Um, it breaks, you fix it, and that's that. But um, uh, so steps two and three, you know, performing tests, using experiments to catalog the symptoms and try to hypothesize the cause of the malfunction, that's missing in the changing light bulb example. So uh, that's why that's not an example of what I'm talking about. And I think it's the puzzle that makes this an interesting hobby. It's, it's like Rubik's Cube or Sudoku, like anything that people enjoy spending time doing, uh, that's kind of a key ingredient. There's got to be sort of a puzzle to it. Um, so you probably engage in this activity. For example, you know, if you have a cell phone's USB connector go funny, and uh, you, know, you observe that if you wiggle it just right, you can still charge your phone, um, then OK, you've engaged in this activity. But I would also point out, please don't do this. This is not safe. Um, <laughs> modern cell phones draw so much power to charge that uh, these fault protection circuitry in the power supply will burn down your house before it decides to stop the current. So yeah, you really have to be careful these days. So like in a, as an example, I don't jog, but sometimes I have to run to catch a bus. So um, <laughs> you know, you might not see yourself as an electronics hobbyist, but, but you probably engage in this activity. So here's some specific examples of you know, things I fix, and, and they're up here to see if you want to come see them later. This is a Fluke 8060A. It's a four and a half digit handheld multimeter. Uh, it's an example of a piece of equipment from the USA in the early 1980s. I actually stole this from a summer job, to keep it quiet. Um, it was non-functioning, and uh, I knew that you know, if I asked, they would say, no, no, it is government property, you can't take this, it has to go through surplus disposal. But it was just going to go into a landfill site, for sure. So I just took it away and fixed it. Um, so we'll get back to that sort of motivation later. This is another one. Um, so this was actually useful. I got this because I thought I could fix it and use it to do stuff. This one I just got because it's so cute. Um, <laughs> it's, there's, there's really no use for this device. Uh, <laughs> this is, it's, it's a, a, a TRIO model C050 oscilloscope. So it's made in Japan, dates from the 50s or 60s. Um, but it's just so small and it's got like a little screen, just like a real oscilloscope. And um, so, but I, I was going to also talk about the dangers of this activity. And this is 
this was going to be sort of an example of this. Um, these old devices, they have very high voltages in them. This, this has kilovolt potentials in it. Um, there, are, uh, there are capacitors, condensa if you're Japanese, um, that they just go bad over time. That's the normal, normal thing for a capacitor to do. They deteriorate and they become conductive. And um, th so they, they basically act as a short circuit inside the device. And so if you find something like this, it looks really cool and you know, you're maybe tempted to plug it in, but really find someone who knows what they're doing and ask for help um, and you need a plan B. So like when you plug this in, be prepared to put out a fire, be, be, be prepared to remove the power from it without having to touch this switch, right? Um, so have like a, a cord you can pull, a switch on a, on a you know, so you have to be prepared. <laughs> no, this is, I fixed it. <laughs> so this has been completely recapped. All the capacitors are, are new, uh, so it's good for another 50 years. Um, uh, so this one, this is, this is what gonna, I'm going to walk through, you know, what, you know, what does it look in, like inside when you get one of these things and you try to fix it up. So this is a Iwatsu, another Japanese piece of uh, test equipment, a VOAC 7510. It's a five and a half digit bench multimeter. This one dates from, I think, 1993. You can see in the photos the date code on some of the parts later. Um, so spoiler alert, of course, it's working, so I got it fixed. Um, it, here it's reading zero. It's still reading, if anyone noticed when I plugged it in, it was reading 22 millivolts. It's down to 15. As it warms up, the, it'll get better and better. Um, it takes an hour or two to come into spec. Um, <laughs> So, well, that's, that's kind of normal. This is a, actually quite a high-precision piece of equipment. When you see inside, uh, you'll be amazed. So this is the state it was in when I got it. Uh, this was my first purchase off Yahoo Auctions. Um, it was 1,000 yen plus delivery. Um, it was advertised as not working, you know, no, would not power on. And I thought, well, I've fixed lots of things that won't power on. It's just uh, always you know, something simple in the power supply. Well, this one, it was completely disintegrated. Uh, this, ba this battery had exploded and um, rotted the electronics. This is a crystal oscillator that runs the, the CPU. Um, so here's another photograph of the interior. Uh, the battery used to be here, and so I thought, well, this is just a write-off. I mean, maybe I can get a couple of parts out of this, but anyway, the more I looked at it, the more I thought, well, you, why not? Just, uh, it's, I can't wreck it more than this, right? So um, <laughs> why not give it a shot? There are three parts that are irreplaceable. This contains the software. So if that, the chip itself is easily replaced, but the software is not. So if that chip is shot, then that's, the device is dead. This is a custom component made before Iwatsu for this meter. So if that could not be salvaged, then it would be dead. And this little chip here, the chip itself, again, is replaceable, but it contains the calibration data, so which uh, could not be restored. Um, so some more photos. This is the analog to digital converter board. This transistor has corroded right off. You can see the battery just basically spewed, like projectile barf all over everything. Um, so, you know, I just sort of, it was just elbow grease, mostly. You just keep scraping and scraping and scraping until you get all the faulty components out. Uh, but you can see how delicate it is. This is a ceramic wafer. It's up on an aluminum block, and it's only connected to the rest of the circuitry by these kind of like filament-like little wires. So while I was chiseling away at this battery shmoo, I was had to be very careful not to disturb this thing. And this is part of why it takes a while to stabilize. All the, the temperatures all have to come into equilibrium inside the circuit. So this is the analog to digital board after cleaning. Uh, this is with the new transistor in. That's the only part that got replaced on that. Um, the memory board, so that ROM is out, but uh, it, it worked okay. This board was very badly damaged, so it required some, some, some jumpers put in. The connectors are still not installed yet, but. Uh, that was the calibration data ROM. Uh, I managed to drill it out of these holes and then re sort of t you know, clean up these pins. So it actually came out okay. And that's it all reassembled with all the new components in. And, um, and it worked. Uh, it just basically came back to life. This is a 0.1% resistor, uh, 30K ohms, and it's reading 30K ohms. It's uh, actually a little bit on the high side, uh, but considering the state it was in, um, that's not so bad. So I'm pretty happy with that outcome. So why do I do it? Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm cheap, right? Uh, but I'm also concerned about waste. And, and that was, you know, the, this handheld multimeter, I was, I just sort of upset me to see something like this go into the garbage unnecessarily, um, even though it would take a lot of work to get it working. So, um, so y you know, I'm kind of motivated to sort of save stuff. Um, and also, you know, the puzzles are fun, but not if you fail. And I guess the thing is, 
I, you know, it kind of works out. I, I keep fixing stuff, so I, I kind of get rewarded for what I'm doing. So in Japan, uh, things have been a little different. Um, this is my workbench. It's a spare desk in my office. Um, everything in it is from Japan. This is uh, an oscilloscope I fixed from Hardoff. That's another oscilloscope from Hardoff. Uh, that's an AC power supply to prevent me from getting shocked. Um, this is, um, that's another little multimeter I got out of Hardoff. Um, this I got, this is the only thing I paid full price for. It's a power supply. Uh, I tried to find a junk one, but I just never got around to it, or never found one, so I had to buy that in an actual store. Um, so, so where you look for stuff, so the Japanese used electronics market is actually very, uh, very well stocked. Um, so this is the Hachioji Hardoff um, in west of Tokyo. Um, it's probably w the best in Japan. I go to every hard off I can, and um, this consistently has quite a good selection of test equipment, you know, old, junky test equipment that you can fix up. Um, of course, Akihabara and Tokyo, so when I say how has Japan changed, I'm kind of also really talking about Tokyo. Um, w when I first moved here and people said, oh, what do you want to do in Tokyo? And I said, go to Akihabara, and they said, oh, Akihabara? And, no, no, not the maid cafe, it's the electronics. <laughs> and this is... This is, that road there is Maid Cafe Alley. You've really got to dodge the, you know, they're trying to get you to buy drinks and go to lunch. And anyway, but this is, so Akizuki Denshi is pretty good, but you just want to scream by the time you're out of here because it's so packed. Uh, and I can't remember Marush, I can't remember the name of this one, but that the blue and white sign, if you Google Akizuki Denshi, you'll get the, the spot on Google Maps. And this one here has probably one of the best selections of discrete components in, well, I've seen anywhere. So they have high precision resistors and capacitors. You go down into the basement to get all that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, this issue of keeping things out of the landfill sites, this is, you know, what happens to electronics when it's not working. Um, I'm using this photo without permission, so I encourage you to go and read the original article. Each US family trashes 400 iPhones worth of e waste a year. I, I, anyway, this blows my mind. Um, a uh, deluge of electronic waste turning Thailand into world's rubbish dump. This is basically a river of ground up LCD monitors. Um, so that's, this is, this is e-waste, electronic waste. The United Nations estimates that 50 million tons of electronic waste is produced each year, and it, most of it is toxic. Uh, so electronics contains uh, cadmium, lithium, uh, these older things frequently had asbestos in them as an insulator. Um, you know, so electronic waste is generally considered toxic waste and has to be disposed of in, in, you know, in compliance with the Basel Convention on the Movement of, of Toxic Material, which was, it's a treaty that was signed to try to prevent developed nations from dumping toxic waste onto developing nations. Uh, but some countries don't take it too seriously. So Canada, my home, it exploits a loophole in the treaty. It's, uh, it's it, now this is quite the acronym, Export and Import of Hazardous Waste and Hazardous Recyclable Material Regulations. The IRFMER <laughs> states that uh, that's its official acronym. Anyway, it, it states that electronics that are intact are not waste. Uh, and so they are, oops, they are not uh, subject to the Basel Convention. So, you know, it sort of motivates you to smash your stuff before they're throwing it out. But yeah, that's the key. This is the loophole that some people use. Japan was one of the first countries to implement e-waste recycling, but only about 25% of the country's e-waste is recycled. So, so it's, it's ranked as sort of the third most wasteful country behind USA and China. I tried to find um, some more information about the right to repair movement in Japan, but I, I was unable to. So uh, that's something that we can get to at the end of this. Um, so let me explain what right to repair means with a little story uh, from my own life. So this is a, a binary clock. This was a kit I got when I was very, very young in the early 1980s. It's a digital clock that uses uh, LEDs to display the time in what's called binary coded decimal. So this is the hours, this is the minutes, this is the seconds. Uh, it, I don't know if you could, I took this a little after midnight. This is 8.57 uh, is the time. Um, so. This kit was manufactured by a company in Toronto in the 1980s called Active Surplus, and they used to build these kits from parts they would get at low prices from the surplus market. So since the kit was from the 80s, the LEDs in it were probably uh, from the late 1970s, which makes them probably an example of one of the very early generations of commercial LEDs made by Fairchild Semiconductor. Anyway, I was a kid when I built it, and it didn't work. 
And I had put it on a shelf and sort of forgotten about it for 30 years and decided, you know, I'm going to fix this clock. So it turned out to be a simple problem. I had just put all the LEDs in backwards. So, um, <laughs> but um, w one of them was actually, <laughs> one of them was actually burnt out. And um, so it had to be replaced. And then I didn't want the one to look different. So I thought, well, I'll replace them all. So I went down to a local parts shop. I bought a bunch of brand new LEDs. And what I had not realized is that 30 years of it, research into the efficiency of LEDs had occurred. And when the new LEDs were put, it was like staring into the blazing sun when this thing was turned <laughs> And I'm not kidding. The way you told time with it was you close your eyes, you stared at it, you quickly opened your eyes and closed them. <laughs> And then you read the time off the green dots that had been burned into your <laughs> retina. <laughs> um, okay, so I needed, to, I needed to lower the power that was flowing through these LEDs, and, but I needed to figure out how this worked to do that, so I needed to reverse engineer it. I needed to obtain a circuit diagram explaining how the thing worked. And um, this is it. So, so this is what I came up with. Of course, if you aren't familiar with electronics, it's all gobbledygook. Some of the stuff will be obvious. That's obviously the pokey bit that goes on the wall. These are the LEDs. I've sort of put them in the picture in the order that they're arranged on the circuit board. But this allows you to see that it's these four parts here that control the current through these LEDs, not these four down here. So there's kind of, there's, there were two options. It could have been these ones or these ones. And I saw from this diagram that it's these ones that have to be changed to lower the current. Um, so what I just did there, take a device apart that I own, document what I learn, and show it to you, is pretty much illegal. Um, it's not really illegal, there's not actually a law that prevents it from happening, but uh, if you do this regularly, you'll probably find yourself being sued. Uh, because, um, well, we can get to this. So there are, there are people in companies that do this regularly. So some examples, Clymer and Chilton, they produce service manuals for uh, motorcycles, tractors, uh, Sam's Technical Publishing. They, do are, they are actually hired by companies to make service manuals for products, but they also just do it themselves for stuff that they're not hired to do, and they sell what's called a photo fact manual. Um, so Luis Rossman, he's an electronics repair technician in New York City, and uh, he produces YouTube videos in which he shows people how to fix things, including Apple computers. And sometimes he shows a portion of a schematic diagram. Uh, so this is an example, this is a screen capture from one of his videos, it's, this is the, a section of the power management section of a MacBook, and Apple has sent him warning letters saying that they consider these to be copyrighted works of Apple, and that he's uh, on thin ice uh, showing these to people. Um, he has not been sued, but he's been warned that he's got to not do this. In 2017, uh, Henrik Kuspi, I don't know how to say that, maybe if there's a uh, Norwegian in the audience, they can see that. Anyway, he's a repair technician running a business in Norway. He was sued by Apple for importing uh, r screens from Hong Kong that had Apple's logos on. So the issue is that there are these companies that disassemble broken screens and reassemble them from the working parts that, that you know, so they salvage working parts from many screens and put them back together. And Apple uh, liberally imprints its logos on the internal components in, in things. And so the result is a thing that has a few little Apple logos on it. He sells them as refurbished phones. He does not advertise them as original Apple products, but they have this logo, and that's uh, what he was sued for, for importing them into Norway from Hong Kong. He, Apple lost this lawsuit, but not in the United States. Uh, Jessa Jones runs a company called iPad Rehab. Um, one of her children flushed a phone down the toilet. She removed the toilet and smashed it and got the phone back out, and then uh, decided to you know, try to recover the data. Apple refuses to perform data recovery if the phone can't be turned on. So there's a story about this. The, and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's Apple Can't Help How Molecular Biologists Trained Stay-at-Home Moms to Recover Lost iPhones. There's a story about her business. But last May, she had the same treatment. She had, so the Department of Homeland Security seized the shipment of phone screens that were uh, headed towards her. You can read about this on vice.com. And this is a photo of what's being talked about here. So this is the, the screen, this is a refurbished screen, so it's reassembled from broken components plus a few replacements, um, and this cable, of course, has been reused, not thrown in the landfill, but reused from one of the original screens, and so it still has this little logo stuck on it, and that's the trademark violation. Um, this is a story from Canada. Ed Richardson, he's the manager of the city of Winnipeg's police radio shop. Well, Winnipeg is a city in the sort of middle of Canada. Um, they use Motorola radios, and these radios will spontaneously disable themselves after a period of time and require you to enter a new encryption key 
to be continue to be used with the encryption feature at a cost of $94 per radio per update. So he got a little annoyed that they were paying money to prevent products that they owned from spontaneously disabling themselves. Uh, and he obtained a collection of keys by some other means, which is yet to be <laughs> revealed. Um, and he was using them to update the radios. So he has uh, been charged with fraud uh, by the city of Winnipeg's own police. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, this has not gone before the courts yet. So we'll see what happens. But um, uh, anyway, there's, I think there's quite a bit of, there's a bit of a story here. There's a ham radio guy who had reverse engineered the things and, and they, the two of them knew each other and he, the ham radio guy is perhaps was selling these things in the United States and it was the, actually an FBI investigation that led to this. Anyway, this is all of speculation, but so it'll come out in the court case what's going on. But um, so this, this affects you, not just people who do electronic stuff. John Deere, they make tractors in the United States. I'm almost out of time here. They, uh, they were doing the same thing that Apple does with electronics to, to tractor parts and they were basically preventing uh, farmers from repairing their own tractors. Politicians took this more seriously. They viewed this as a corporate threat to sovereignty, to the food security of the United States. And so California has passed laws banning this uh, practice for tractors. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, the state of Massachusetts in the United States has passed this right to repair initiative. It prohibits automobile manufacturers from making diagnostic information available only to their own dealers. They have to sell it to the public as well um, if it's available. And on, in Ontario, this is in Canada, there is currently a, a bill working its way through, through the provincial legislature uh, that is basically going to do the same things for electronics. Um, and well, we'll see what happens to that. So what can you do? If this is something that worries you, uh, you can vote with your wallet, right? Do a bit of research, see if the products you're about to buy can be repaired. Um, and if they can't be, and if there's no alternative, like if, if everybody makes laptops that can't be repaired, then, um, then let companies know, at least go and ask the question, can I repair this if it breaks? You know, do you have a policy that prevents people from recovering data from water damaged products, these sorts of things. Um, even if the answer comes back that no, we, you can't fix it, at least you know, at the end of the month, if they do some sort of summary of what were customers asking when they came into the stores, that'll be on the radar. Um, and you could also just try yourself, find something, fix it. So this is from, uh, <laughs> this is currently for sale in Yahoo auctions. I learned a new Japanese word, uh, ax. The word for an ax is an ono, which I think is, uh, <laughs> It would be a good word in English, right? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and so so uh, I, I apologize to whoever is currently bidding on this, but it's currently only 500 yen. Look, it turns on. It says it's initialized. I don't know. So uh, all right. So contact information, uh, that's me. All right. <laughs>